The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed by the manager, as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, Make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone they may welcome you into eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. Whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, settle over us with your spirit. Come to us, Lord, that we might truly understand what you would have us know. Open our hearts to be your people. Amen. Okay, now I need some help from the audience. This is an audience engagement here. So, David, will you come? And Tina, you haven't been warned, but come anyway. (laughs) This won't be very difficult. If you two would just stand and face each other. Okay, David, what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute is say to her, good morning, I'm glad to see you. But I want you to think as you're saying that, I really want her to know that God loves her. Okay, can you do that? Good morning, glad to see you. Okay, now I want you to say the very same words, good morning, I'm glad to see you. But I want, to be, I want you to be thinking in your head, I want her to, t- to know this so that I want her to say that to her so that she will invite me to brunch and pay for my bill. (laughs) Okay? Um, Well, um, good morning. It's great to see you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) Well, they taught us, didn't they, that we can always discern people's motives by the words that they use or even by the expressions on their face, right? We don't really know what's in a person's heart just simply by what they say. We can sometimes know that if it's particularly extreme, but really, mostly we don't. And motives really do matter because they are an expression of our character and they reveal, if only to ourselves, even when they're not detectable to someone else, they do reveal who we are at the very center of our being. Probably you might have guessed that this particular gospel for this morning is not one of my long list of favorites. It's a really hard gospel. I have a pastor friend who says, I just wish Jesus had never told that parable. It's a difficult parable to understand. So the heart of understanding this whole thing for today is to look first at the teaching of Jesus. And just what we're going to do is just lift that parable out of there as if Jesus hadn't told it. Study his teaching. And once we have that, then we're going to look at the parable from the perspective of how it serves or illustrates the meaning of the teaching. So the teaching that Jesus is giving here is twofold. It is, if you are honest in little, you'll be honest in much. If you're dishonest in little, you'll be dishonest in much. 
And the second piece of it is, no one can serve two masters, whatever they are, money and wealth or, and God cannot be served together. That's sort of hard enough. So the first thing we would say about the teaching of Jesus for today is that it is a teaching of who is your God. This is about even having ever, this is about having God as your God or having a false God. Now before we go any farther, let me say I think Luther was really helpful on this point because Luther said everyone has a God. By definition, a God is whatever you think is most important in life. It is whatever you trust the most and that to which you are most devoted. So even somebody who says there is no God has something that they trust, and that is then by definition their God. The issue isn't whether or not you have a God. The issue is whether or not your God is the real God or something else. And so the teaching that Jesus gives in this section is all about, do you have a real God, the God that I am revealing to you, or do you have a false God, some other God? Now understand also that there's myriads of false gods to choose from. In our culture, they're probably different than they were in first century to some extent, but they're still all around us. They can be self. If you trust yourself more than anything else in the world, that's your false God. Or it can be money or sex or drugs or alcohol or gaming or fame or fortune, whatever it might be, a false God can and be present in your life, and sometimes it's so subtle that you don't even realize that that's the God that you are following. You can tell when you have a false God because gods drive our lives. That is to say, if money is your God, it will drive your life. That's how you'll make your decisions. That's how you'll move through your life. If God is your God, that's what will drive your life. And so you look at your life and determine what the false gods that are keeping you away from God really are. So Jesus is aware that in his culture, and probably every other culture that's ever been, money is one of the most common false gods. It's one of the great temptations that draws us away from God. And so he uses an illustration of money, although it could be used for any kind of false god. So we would ask the question first, what does it look like if you have a money god? If money is more important and you trust it more than anything else in the world, including God, what does your life look like? Well, that person might be someone who will do anything for personal gain, even at the expense of other people. Or that person might be someone who places money ahead of family and friends. That might be seen in someone who insists on working all the time, even when they could make the choice to be with family. This is a person who does anything they need to do in order to protect their nest egg, which, by the way, they never think is enough. They're always afraid they're going to run out of it, and so they protect it at all costs. And that might include lying or being miserly or cheating on their taxes or any kind of way of protecting the nest egg. And most seriously, if money is your God, the biggest issue you will have with it is you begin to think it can save your life. So people who worship the God of money will do things like spend oodles of money trying to continue to look the same age they did 30 years ago. Or they may spend gobs of money on all kinds of weird uh, supplements and other things, thinking that that will make them live a really, really long time. When you invest your life, you invest it in things that matter based on what your God is. And the truth of the matter is that if you look at your life carefully, you will discern that over time you become increasingly like your false God. So the more you follow that God, whatever it is, or the more you follow the God of the gospel, the more like that God you will become. So that's the teaching that we're working with. And now I want to look again at the parable and see it from the perspective of how it illustrates or gives information around that, that teaching, that this is about what God you have and how you live in response to that God. So the first thing we have to do if we want to look at the parable is we have to look at the character of the manager. This manager is dishonest. He is named shrewd. Well, if you look up shrewdness in the dictionary in Webster, you'll discover that that really means just nothing more complex than to be sharp 
or discerning about how to deal with practical matters. And in fact, the Greek word behind shrewdness is the word for prudence. So in and of themselves, those are not bad things. The problem is the illustration that Jesus uses is illustrating a kind of shrewdness which is driven by dishonesty and personal gain at the expense of others, and that is a problem. God does not endorse that. God never endorses dishonesty. You don't find that anywhere in the scripture, that God's all right with that sort of nature. And it is revelatory of his place with his false god. You'll do anything you can to protect your false god when you are doing that. And understand also that his dishonesty causes him to lead others to become dishonest. Take those debtors, for example. To our modern ears, it sounds like they're just getting a bargain on what they owe. But think about what really happens here. He goes out to these debtors and he says, how much do you owe? And then he cuts down how much they owe and they pay it right away. What that means is that they could have been paying the master all along. They're not paying because they know they owe that. It's not a moral decision to pay. They're just doing the best pay thing that they can. In other words, they have been withholding from the master. And now they are also shrewd because they withheld and withheld until they had an opportunity to do it with less. That also is dishonest. It's not a bargain here. It's something they rightly owed and had agreed to owe. And now they are choosing a step which the master never approved of in the first place. So it becomes a catapult. It becomes a a stirring up, a cycle of what we do leads others around us to begin to behave in the same way. And that's true when you have a real God. When you have the real God, you live in such a way that stirs others also to love and act correctly in this. So you ask yourself then, why did Jesus commend this dishonest manager? Well, the word for commend there is not actually a complimentary word. It's a word that literally means the master understands. The master sees what has happened. He's not fooled by what the manager did. He recognizes what the manager has done. It's a dishonest act, and the master basically recognizes it to be so. And that's also what we should say about God. God always knows what's in our hearts. We cannot fool God about our motives. We might be able to fool each other and act in ways that no one else could discern what our motives are, but God knows our heart, and God has not been fooled by what we do. The commentators are a little confused about this text, too. They're all over the board. Some commentators say Jesus is speaking with irony, tongue-in-cheek. Others say, well, he's just trying to get you to be a little more aware of the shrewdness of the culture, but, you know, he doesn't really want you to be that way, but he wants you to have a better understanding. I think that's far too simplistic. Because you know what? Being particularly good at something bad still doesn't make it good. And there is not one instance in the scripture where someone who has personal gain at the expense of another person is seen as good. Jesus isn't saying this is good. He is describing that it is known, it is understood, it is found out. Now, think about how relevant this is for our culture. Because we live in a world where a lot of people really admire shrewdness. They even sometimes are in awe of shrewdness, even when it might hurt another person. I mean, don't you know some people who, when they go through the drive window and they get too much change, they think they've done something really clever? Who pays that little $5 extra money that that was given to them? Maybe the poor person serving at the window who's probably making minimum wage. How does this work in our understanding of morality and rightness? And don't you know some people think it's okay to cheat as long as they don't get caught, and others who blame everyone else for what's wrong in their life, even though in their heart of hearts they know they've done it. We live in a world, all people have lived in a world, where shrewdness and dishonesty is not always shunned, but where sometimes we see it as admirable, but it is not so with God who reads and knows the hearts and the motives of our hearts. The other reason what Jesus talks about is so relevant is because it has consequences. 
Think of the consequences for the manager. He has made himself think that if he does this thing, it will end up actually being that these people will care for him when he's out of a job. So he's done a good turn for them, so he can go to them, and they'll give him a place to live, and they'll care for him. But it has never been my experience that people who are themselves dishonest and self-serving are very likely to care about anyone else much. I mean, witness what happened in the USSR in the darkest days of communism, where neighbors would turn in their neighbors and friends and sometimes even their families in order to make their own life a little bit easier. It just doesn't track that you would have a place to go to because of your dishonestly giving them a little heads up. But when you follow God, you have the one who can have bearing on not only this life, but the next. And it does lead you to live differently. If God and God's agenda is driving your life, you do lots of things differently. One of those things might be for us that we just patiently trust God in this time of transition. That we recognize that God knows what to do and God is doing it and God is at work and we can trust it and we just give ourselves over to that and stop worrying. Or it may sometimes mean that we literally give home a place of safety to someone who's hurt us or might even be thought of as enemy. Jerry was born in 1930. He died in 1999. He was born in Slovakia. That would have been sort of in those tumultuous wars right before uh, World War II, and he lived there until he came with his new wife, Mildred, to the United States. But those early years really shaped him in some very unhappy ways. You can imagine how much you have to forgive and how much you have to forget if you've been raised in that kind of a circumstance. And so it was that early in his marriage, he began to drink a lot. Soon it was clear that he was an alcoholic. And when he was drinking, he was very abusive to his wife and to his children. It was hard for her to stay but she just never left him, even though there was a lot of abuse in the system. That's kind of what makes it sort of surprising that when he came home diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, she agreed to care for him in their home. I mean, it could have been so easy for her to say, no, you just you have to go somewhere else. I'm not going to care for you. You were mean and abusive to me all these years. But in fact, it created a lot of angst for her as well. She spent a lot of sleepless nights worrying about it. She worried all the time. She constantly felt guilty and shame that she had stayed in such a horrible marriage for so long. She had wasted her life. She had disrupted her children. Her children weren't exactly functioning very well because they'd experienced all of this abuse. And she was just riddled with all this stuff. But maybe worst of all, during those days, she was most concerned about the fact that she just couldn't sleep. She had promised him that he would not die alone, so she could not let herself go to sleep. She told me that she tried to sleep in the chair by his bed, but she couldn't let herself really fall off to a deep sleep because she was so afraid that he might die while she was sleeping and be alone. And that was the one promise she made him, and she was determined to keep it. I reminded her of Psalm 121, which says, God is your keeper, and God neither sleeps nor slumbers. I said, Mildred, you can sleep because God never does. A couple days later, at 4 a.m., she called me to say that he had just died. I went to her house. I actually got there before the hospice nurse and before the um, funeral home came, and we had quite a conversation in which she told me that earlier that evening she had remembered the psalm and she thought to herself, I'm going to sleep tonight. She went into the other bedroom and she was getting the best sleep that she'd had in months and months. And she said at 3.30 she had to go to the bathroom. So she got up, went to the bathroom, and she decided, I'm up, I'll check on him. She went in, walked over to his bed, reached out to stroke his head. He opened his eyes, said her name, said, I'm sorry, made a deep sigh, and died. Now, she was not able to care for him out of her own stamina. She was able to care for him because she knew and loved God, 
and believed it was what God was calling her to do. Your God drives your life. Look at your life and you'll see who your God is. Is it this God, the God of love, grace, compassion, and mercy, who speaks plainly about wrongs and yet somehow finds a way to give a home even when there has been a wrong? Is your God this one who went and died for you on the cross in order that you can let go of the brokenness, that you can forgive yourself for those things of guilt and shame, that you can stop letting your life be driven by all that? Or is it something else that you're hiding in, that you're thinking somehow, if I just had enough money, if I just had enough fame, if I just had enough time, I could be happy? It's clear to me that the parable and the teaching today leaves us two choices. One is God and the consequences for our daily walk and the eternal consequences, and the other is whatever false God you might want to name and the consequences of living like that and the consequences on our eternal life. So choose God and live accordingly.